Recording will start soon. Recording will start soon. Come on, baby. So, how's everyone doing? Oh, beep boop, we are recording. Excellent. So this is our lecture for chapter 15, lesson three, which is all about the 14th Amendment, the single most important amendment to the Constitution. As I just said a little bit ago, you might think the First Amendment is your favorite amendment to the Constitution. You're wrong. It's the 14th. You might think that you love the Second Amendment. Well, you probably love the 14th Amendment even more, and we'll go over why in just a little bit. Uh, the 14th Amendment is incredibly important to defining what modern American government looks like, and the 14th Amendment is the amendment that has done the most to expand Americans' protections from governmental abuse. That said, the 14th Amendment is really like four different amendments in a trench coat together. And even if we just look at section one of the 14th Amendment, we see a lot, a lot of important stuff in there. I've color coded it here by four different clauses and four different sections about the 14th Amendment just in section one that are all just incredibly important. Let's take it color by color and talk about them. Number one, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. This clause here is incredibly important because it defines that citizenship is something that you are entitled to as soon as you are born on U.S. soil or an area that is under the jurisdiction of U.S. soil. If you are born to non-citizen parents in Florida, congratulations, you are an American citizen. If you are born to American citizens in a Panama Air Force Base, congratulations. American citizen. Uh, it doesn't matter the legal status of one's parents. It doesn't matter uh, any other, no other factors matter. If you are born inside of the United States, slap an American flag on you, you are now an American citizen. The context of the 14th Amendment and is important to understanding why it is that birthright citizenship was a necessity and why it is that birthright citizenship fundamentally exists. What the 14th Amendment is an 1868, a post-Civil War addition to the uh, U.S. Constitution. And the 14th Amendment then is designed to grant citizenship to all people who were formerly slaves. Viewed as being non-citizens of the United States, even though they were born on U.S. soil, the 14th Amendment takes it and makes it so that anyone who is born in the United States, even if they did not have past citizenship, is officially a citizen of the United States. And I've got a chat question. He he slap an American flag. The American flag slaps. Um, yep. Uh, and really, the instantaneous nature uh, and the universal nature of birthright citizenship is a, a very important part of the 14th Amendment. If your parents are on vacation, if your Guatemalan parents are on vacation in the United States, or your Thai parents, or any nationality parents are on vacation in the United States, and whoopsie daisy, there goes birth, congratulations, that child is an American citizen instantaneously. If you are born in U.S. territory, no questions asked, you are a U.S. citizen instantly. Citizenship it is also noted then is a binary thing. You either are a citizen or you are not a citizen, and citizenship is complete according to that clause. Uh, if you there is no distinction there between a person who gets birthright citizenship or somebody who becomes a citizen through naturalization. There is no flavors of citizenship. 
there is only citizenship under the 14th Amendment, and it also makes you a citizen of your state, too. If you are a citizen of the United States, you are also going to be viewed as a citizen of the state that you reside in. Birthright citizenship, important historically, but then also very important in the modern day to many questions of immigration. Ooh. Well, what if one's uh, parents are in the United States without documentation? Well, that person who's born in the United States, even if their parents are here without documentation, is entitled to U.S. citizenship, which makes immigration a thorny question sometimes. Our second section here is definitely the reason why I say give the cop out of the 14th Amendment is your favorite amendment to the Constitution, because even if you like another one, the 14th Amendment is really the amendment that makes all of the other rights given in the Constitution universally protected. Our second clause here, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. If you like the Second Amendment, well, the Second Amendment says that Congress will make no law dealing with uh, infringing upon the right to keep and bear arms. It's required that for that to be a real right, that that right also applies to the states. It is the second clause of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment that guarantees that not only will the national government not deal with the right to keep and bear arms, or the Fourth Amendment and search and seizure, or the First Amendment and freedom of speech, or the establishment of a state religion. Uh, not only will the national government not interfere with those rights, but those are your rights as a citizen of your state as well. And if it's one of your rights as a citizen of the United States, it is also one of your rights as a person within that state. We'll talk about that next, this concept of incorporating the Bill of Rights, because once upon a time, it was viewed that the Bill of Rights is just an agreement between the national government and the citizens, not an agreement between the state governments and the citizens. That clause there, that purple clause in the 14th Amendment is what makes it so that there is, that the Bill of Rights applies to your state governments as well. Then our golden clause here, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Chapter 16 is going to really flesh this out for us, uh, what our due process rights include. I do want to call back to our reading check question, though, about uh, procedural and substantive due process. Uh, it's worth making that distinction again. Due process not only means that there is a set of policies that you go through, go through, but that you are treated fairly underneath the laws. I've got another section there underlined, though, and that is any person of life, liberty, or process or property without due process of the law. Earlier in the Fourteenth Amendment, it talks about citizens. Well, in this second part of the 14th Amendment, it is deliberately referring to any person under their jurisdiction. Whether or not one is a citizen does not change whether or not they are entitled to due process of the law, nor does it change whether or not they are entitled to equal protection under the laws. Uh, citizenship not necessarily required for equal treatment or fair treatment under the laws according to the U.S. 14th Amendment. Lastly, and the thing that we will get into in tonight's reading in Chapter 15, Lesson 5, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection under the laws. That's what we'll start to take a look at in Chapter 15, Lesson 5 with your reading tonight. A topic I could spend on awfully long time on that I think is worth spending an awfully long time on, but today it looks like we will spend seven minutes on it and then wrap up our uh, lecture. Oh well, uh, virtual learning, it's, it's fun for all of us. Uh, the concept of incorporation of the Bill of Rights, making it explicitly clear that not only does the Bill of Rights apply to the national government, after all, the very first word is Congress shall make no law. The very first words are Congress shall make no law, but that applies to the state government as well. 
that seems obvious to us that North Carolina can't just be like, hey, by the way, the official religion is now Mormonism. Uh, that seems to make sense to us, but I don't think we necessarily always appreciate the full history of what goes on there because in 1833, the Supreme Court gave a ruling that said, no, no, the Bill of Rights, that's a national document. If you want those protections from your state too, you've got to work that out with your state government. They've got to put that into their constitution. This comes from an 1833 property case, a case dealing with uh, eminent domain and a guy's wharf getting destroyed by a local construction project. We won't go into the specifics of the, st of the case there, but it's important to know that in 1833, the first time that the U.S. Supreme Court, the first major time that the U.S. Supreme Court is interpreting whether or not the Bill of Rights applies to the state, John Marshall says, no, this is a national document. Therefore, from 1833 up until the U.S. Civil War, it was very much understood that the Bill of Rights was a national thing, not a state thing. This is how something like slavery, which, you know, obviously interferes with any number of the things in the Bill of Rights, was allowed to continue because it was a state-sanctioned rather than a nationally sanctioned action. Uh, for the Bill of Rights to be the meaningful, powerful document that they are, they have to be applied to the state governments as well, which is what the second clause in the 14th Amendment does, extending all privileges and immunities to state governments as well. But even after 1868 and the passage of the 14th Amendment, this was not a clear and universal thing. 1925 was the first major time that the U.S. Supreme Court then heard a case and they said, yep, the states have to follow the First Amendment just like the national government has to follow the First Amendment. Uh, just like the national government can't create laws that abridge your freedom of speech, the state government cannot create laws that abridge your freedom of speech. Or if they do, they have to follow the same rules that the First Amendment puts on the national government. We talked about those rules back with Chapter 15, Lesson 1 and Chapter 15, Lesson 2. Those rules apply to the states as well. Interesting because in the specific Gitlow case, it was a free speech case, Benjamin Gitlow was tried and convicted under New York law, and the New York law that he was convicted under was found to be in compliance with the First Amendment, but the important part of it was the Supreme Court said, yep, New York has to play by the First Amendment just like the United States has to play by, or the U.S. federal government has to play by the First Amendment. It was found that they could still punish Benjamin Gitlow for, you know, writing a pamphlet saying, hey, go kill the governor. You still can't do that, but you have to give him his First Amendment rights. What then becomes the probably more significant change is in 1937 when a case came before the U.S. Supreme Court dealing with the death penalty. Frank Palco was convicted of murder in Connecticut, and he was convicted to life in prison. The state of Connecticut said, oh boy, that trial went pretty well. We got him pretty good. We could probably try him again and get the death penalty if we wanted. And the state of Connecticut puts Frank Palco on trial again. And Palco says, wait, the Fifth Amendment says that I am immune from double jeopardy, and the Fourteenth Amendment says that my rights as a citizen of the United States also apply to the state of Connecticut. The Supreme Court comes back with a ruling that says, oh, no, they were just talking about the important rights, not the little ticky-tack things like double jeopardy. Frank Palco has tried again and executed that's a very important case for us because it shows that even after the 14th Amendment, the courts have always been sort of, well, this applies, this doesn't. This the states need to do, that the states don't need to do. Throughout the 1960s, almost every part of the Bill of Rights, including the court, has gone back and been like, whoops, sorry, we got it wrong about Palco. Double jeopardy applies to the states too. Throughout the 1960s, almost all of the time the, co the court looked at a part of the Bill of Rights, they came back and they said, okay, that does apply to the state governments too. Uh, 
In fact, there's one odd outlier there leading up to uh, 2010. That's the most recent time that we had part of the Bill of Rights Incorporated when the uh, Supreme Court clarified, nope, the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms is also something that your state governments need to respect, not just the national government. Most of the Bill of Rights does apply to the states in the modern day, but it's important for us to understand this concept of incorporation, partially because of history. The Bill of Rights has not always been the strong shield of uh, protecting against state level abuses that it is in the modern day, and we should know and appreciate that as part of our history. But it also then means, based off of how the courts have ruled, it is possible for, even when you're dealing with national level rights things, for there to be slightly different standards for how this gets applied at the state level than how it is applied at the national level. Things like juries are practiced different in federal courts than they are in state courts. And because of the Constitution being incorporated over time and the Bill of Rights not always applying to the states, that is permissible, constitutionally speaking, even though the word of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights applies to the state governments as well. Y'all, we won't get into the next part, which is the classification system today, but that will tie in very closely to what we're dealing with with Chapter 15, Lesson 5, so I'm not necessarily concerned. We can do that as part of our 15.5 lecture. Uh, Y'all have 15.5 to read for homework for next class, but we are out of time for today. Peace, love, I'll see you on Friday. Take care of yourselves. Enjoy Community Homeroom.